talk is about the contactless generation by Kristen Paget. Thank you. So yeah, minor correction to the uh, the, the the printed handouts. Um, in a few days, my name is actually officially changing to Kristen. So you'll see that's on my Twitter and my email and everything else now. So don't be confused when you see Chris with a K Paget doing lead hacks or stuff. Okay, so what's coming up? Um, I'm going to start out by explaining what is EMV. EMV is the protocol that we're considering here. Um, it's any time you make any kind of contactless payment, um, it's all governed by EMV. I'm going to explain what it is, how it relates to uh, NFC, chip and pin, things like this. Um, how does NFC fit in? Um, I've actually got a... Uh, a excuse me. Um, <laughs> I've got a Galaxy Nexus phone. Um, if you were in the previous talk, they mentioned that Google Wallet is now available thanks to the folks at XDA on the Galaxy Nexus. I've done that and uh, yeah, I'll be talking about that a little bit. Um, how to hack it. Um, ultimately, how can you commit contactless credit card fraud? And you know, what are the defenses? What are the protections? How well do the shields work or not work, as the case may be? Um, lots of demos coming up. A um, couple of demos of live fraud. I'm going to actually be asking for, for volunteers from the audience at a couple of points. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about our solution to it, which is this cute little thing here that we call Guard Bunny. We'll, we'll come back to it all. So lots to come. Okay, so first off, what is EMV? When we talk about contactless payments, what do we actually mean? Well, you can view RFID. Um, in this particular case, we're talking about ISO 1443. Um, that's a, a, a bit banging protocol. You can think of it as, as an equivalent to Ethernet. Uh, it specifies here's how to get bits from A to B and how to get bits back from B to A. That's all it is. NFC and RFID, they're transports. That's all they do. So we're talking about the higher level protocol that sits on top of RFID, um, which is called EMV. Uh, it's called EMV because it was originally started by a consortium of Europay, MasterCard, and Visa. Um, that's the three companies. Uh, JCB and Amex and Discover um, joined later, and then there's been some consolidation as well. Um, essentially, it's, it's a standard consortium from all of the, the, the big card issuers. Um, they define the standards for these next generation payments, as they call them. Um, the way that the standards work, there's actually two standards that are split into three parts in total. Um, so the primary EMV standard says, if you have a contact smart card, this would be chip and pin in Europe, here's how to communicate with the card, here's how to conduct a transaction with that card. They then say for the, for the US market, um, if you have a contactless card, here's how to communicate with that and we'll do the payment exactly the same. So you can think of EMV as defining, on one hand, here's how to communicate with a contact smart card. On the other hand, here's how to, contact with a here's how to communicate with a contactless smart card. And then on the, the, the third perspective, um, regardless of how that communication is taking place, here's how to actually conduct a transaction with it. So um, like I said, contactless over here and chip and pin in Europe, it's the same standard from the same people when you look at the higher level protocols and you get the, the transport layer out of the way. When we talk about NFC, um, NFC is the same thing. It is RFID. What we mean when we say NFC is that the, the NFC chip in this device, this phone, um, we don't call it RFID because when you're talking about RFID, you have a reader and you have a tag. When you're talking about NFC, the, the chip in the phone can act like a reader or it can act like a tag, depending on what the software tells it to do. That's all we mean by NFC. Beyond that, it's, it's identical. It's, it's the same EMV protocol that's, that's going back and forth. Essentially, what your phone is doing is it's emulating that contactless card in your wallet, speaking the same protocol, the same crypto, the same everything. It's identical. So NFC you can view as a superset of ISO 1443 contactless um, communication. And Google Wallet, you can think of as an EMV implementation for that NFC chip. So raise your hand, quick show of hands. Do you have a contactless credit card? OK, so a few people are aware that they do. Um, so what you might not know is that there is no universal symbol for contactless payments. 
Um, the symbol at the, the very beginning, the, the, the waves, that's sometimes used for Wi-Fi, sometimes used for, for contactless. The symbol at the end is present on almost every reader, but the symbols in between, these four, these are the four brands that will actually be on your card. So what I encourage everyone to do is please take your wallets out of your pocket, look at them and see if you've got any of those six symbols. Do it right now. Come on. You want to see those wallets coming out? Take, take your cards out and see if you have any of those logos on any of your cards. So I, I gave... A, a stripped down version of this talk to some, uh, some government security types and um, there was about 10 times as many people discovered during the talk that they did actually have contactless cards than originally thought that they did. So quick show of hands again, how many people based on looking at those symbols and the contents of your wallet have just discovered that you do actually have contactless payment cards? A little cluster over there, some. So not as many. We've probably increased awareness of how many contactless cards there are in this room by, I'd say, 30 or 40 percent. It's, it's being rolled out fairly stealthily. And nowhere do they use the term RFID. Nowhere do they use the term contactless. It's, it's all Visa, PayWave. So, you know, it's whatever. It's RFID, people. Get over it. So let's talk about NFC for a second here. I mentioned that it is identical, so um, I, I haven't looked in too much detail at Google Wallet. I believe that the keys are stored securely in the secure element, in, in the NFC chip in the phone. So in theory, and, and this is you know, a big piece of conjecture here, um, in theory it should not be possible for malware on the phone to extract the keys from NFC and clone your credit card. I guarantee that sooner or later you're going to see a presentation either here or at DEF CON where someone does do that. Um, but in theory, that, that is secure. Um, so yeah, reversing the software, malware on the phone, it shouldn't allow key recovery by design. If it does, there's a problem. Um, the NFC phone, the NFC application on the phone must be active. Now in the case of Google Wallet, if the screen is off, NFC is off. So this is a big, big difference between NFC and a contactless card. You cannot turn off a contactless card. You can turn off NFC. Unless, of course, you've got a BlackBerry, in which case you can't turn off NFC. Um, but then it doesn't support EMV anyway, so you, yeah, whatever. We'll, we'll figure that one out later. Um, another good protection with NFC, you need a PIN number to unlock it. There's no PIN number on a contactless card. Um, you have a timeout, so you know, after you conduct a transaction, you can say, right, stay active for one minute and then turn off, and then require that PIN number again before you can, you can unlock. Essentially, it's, it's the same protocol, but there's a bunch more security layered on top of it. So I, I don't have anywhere near as many complaints about NFC as I do with um, just straight EMV cards, largely because you can turn the thing off. That's essentially what it comes down to. If I was given a choice between an NFC app on my phone or a contactless EMV card, I choose NFC every time because it has that off switch. So let's talk about the, um, the actual cards now. Well, I came back from, uh, from DEF CON a couple years ago and found this sitting in my mailbox. Turns out that Chase had just decided to reissue every card that, that they'd ever issued with contactless. So this thing sat in my mailbox for a couple of weeks because I was you know, away on business before DEF CON and all the rest of it. Um, however, the card itself is secure. Now what do I mean by secure in this context? If you look at how much it would cost you as an attacker to extract the key out of this chip to the point where you can conduct transactions, you can do it. You can always do it. Just ask Travis Goodsby. You know, he, he decaps the chips, extracts the keys. You can always win. The point is it's going to cost you a lot of money. Depending on how good this chip is, it's going to cost you between lower end is about $100,000, higher end could be half a million or up. So let's say you know, somewhere in the middle it's going to cost you a quarter million dollars to extract the key from this card. Do you really expect I've got a quarter million dollar credit limit? I don't. So it's not worth the attacker's while to attack this device, therefore it is secure. At least for, for, for this purpose. So the card is secure. The reader, likewise, the reader uses a secure microcontroller. It, it stores various EMV keys in it, um, you know, primarily public keys so that it can verify the card. 
it is again a secure device. It uses a secure microcontroller. You know, there's there's some reasonably strong protections in it. Well, what about the protocol that the two talk? Well, up until I, I met the, the the two previous speakers, Max and Corey, um, I thought that protocol was secure. I I might be wrong on that one. Um, certainly, this card is capable of an immense level of security. These Jacob cards, these these things run Java. No kidding, your credit cards run Java. How cool is that? Um, they have off-board cryptographic coprocessors. So this thing even has two CPUs, one of which is capable of doing secure on-chip RSA key pair generation. How awesome is that? These things can do SSL. If you wanted to write an SSL application for my credit card, you could do that. These things have immense capabilities. So if there isn't protocol level security, then they're, they're doing it wrong. Unfortunately, it appears that they are doing it wrong. Um, we, we haven't confirmed all the details yet. I, I, we're, we're just kind of catching up on each other's research. We, we, we kind of, you know, decided to join forces a few days before ShmooCon and then, you know, alcohol happened. Um, so we, we haven't quite figured everything out. It's certainly from what they're doing and from what I understand of the protocol, at least some of the data goes by in plain text. At least some of the data is unencrypted. Um, you can definitely extract a card number without authenticating to the card. Um, you can probably extract more, but there may be additional uh, uh, info that's available or additional encryption or authentication that's required. Certainly some data is available, uh, more work is needed. So yeah, the protocol, they're doing it wrong. That's all it comes down to. So, so let's, let's you know, back off from that a second. Let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, you know, it's, it's a secure device talking a secure protocol to a secure reader. We all, we all you know, let, let's just accept that for a moment. Where's the problem? The problem is, when you consider each of these devices in isolation, they're fine. When you put it together as a system, it falls down almost immediately. It just, it, it just dies catastrophically in security terms because this is expected to talk to a point of sale terminal. Now point of sale terminals don't understand RFID because RFID wasn't around when most of these POS systems were designed. Therefore, they understand mag stripes. Therefore, this acts like a Magstripe reader and outputs Magstripe formatted data. No kidding. If I swipe this card over this reader, I have a serial port right here, and out of this serial port comes everything that I need to conduct a transaction in nicely formatted Magstripe format. So literally, all I have to do is forget the fact that there might be security here, Forget the fact that there's security here. Forget the security between the two and just spend 50 bucks on eBay to buy my reader and let it do all of this horrible security stuff for me and look at the plain text that comes out of it by design. It's a little silly. Just a little bit. So how do you turn this into fraud? Well, like I said, these things are widely available. You can buy them used on eBay for around 50 bucks. Um, if you want to buy them brand new, you get some nice, uh, nice test cards and you know other odds and ends. They're about 200 bucks new. Um, they're, they're not expensive. Essentially, all you do is um, you buy your 200 dollar re reader. You let it handle all of the crypto and all of the security and all the authentication. You take that data that comes out, and then you spend a few hundred bucks on a Magstripe reader writer, and you copy and paste from one to the other. You want to see it work? Okay. I need a volunteer. So, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> you, you'll like this. I have for sale a shiny $20 bill, which I'm going to sell for the bargain price of only $15, but I only accept contactless payments. Is, is there a soul here that is brave enough to make $5 by, by granting me a little bit of trust? Okay, here we go. Round of applause, please.
Oh, that one, yeah. Ah. Ah. Sorry, one second here. I've got too many windows up and there we go. Okay. Yeah, okay, I'll get a move on. <laughs> All right, so, if you would be so kind as to swipe your card. Thank you. Um, if you look at the screen, there's nothing happening. That's not a good sign. Good for me. <laughs> Try it again. Trust me. Okay, these readers can be a little flaky. Corey, do you have one I can borrow? Damn it. Um, <laughs> of course. Uh, let me just try my test card here, make sure it's working. No, apparently the Schmookon jitters are getting it. It's communicating with the reader, but the reader is just not doing what it's supposed to do. Damn you. Well, let me, let me try turning it off and on again. Oh, wait. We may have a culprit. There's a plug in. Yay, now we're working. Okay, so, if you would be so kind. I love this just because I'm, I'm wearing a security shirt and I know my name and my expiration last four going up there and I'm calling and canceling my card. Over Welcome to my world. I I cancel a card after every single contactless security talk I get. Okay, before you put your card away, if you can just check that the last four digits that you see on the screen are the same as the last four digits of your card, and the expiry date. Okay, right. Hold that thought one second. So, now what we need to do is, uh, come back to this window. And come to the MagStripe writer software. So this <laughs> you, you were planning on canceling that card, right? So MagStripe card success. Right, you're, you're going to have to be my, my witness here, so um, I pull up, you guys familiar with Square, little mobile card readers? Right, so Square application, uh, no, clear that, $15, right, swipe the card to charge. Oh, please retry, swipe more quickly. Authorizing, approved. Would you like a receipt? <laughs> Put your phone number or email address in there. Wait for it. Wait for it. Where's the period on this thing? On the corner. <laughs> you paid $15. Thanks. I'm just reading what it says on the screen. And this is yours. Thank you. Round of applause. Thank you. What's your name? Oh, I just have my coat now. <laughs> okay, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay.
<laughs> Who wouldn't trust this? Come on. <laughs> so, I guess the lesson that we take away from this is, as long as the serial port is plugged in, it's really easy. Okay. So what are the limitations on this? Well, this this will be you know slightly reassuring to to you know that guy at least. Um, the way that these these EMV cards work, every time you read that card, um, you get a different CVV code. So so if you have a contactless card, you've actually got three CVVs on there. You've got one CVV that's printed on the back. That's the one that you you give over the phone when you're ordering pizza. You have another that's encoded on the mag stripe, different CVV. The, the, one, the CVV that I get from a contactless read, it changes every time I read the card. So I get one transaction to conduct per read of the card. So I don't know how many times I just read that card, but it was the last one that actually succeeded, went onto the mag stripe and was processed, which means that I cannot use any of those earlier reads if I tried to his card would just be automatically disabled, even though he's clearly on the phone with his bank right now. <laughs> Whatever. So, so you can think of it like a, uh, an, an RSA uh, secure ID key fob. Um, probably about as secure as well. Um, the, the, if you present the, 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 the rotating CVV, if you present those out of order, the card gets disabled, the tag gets disabled at least. Um, if you present them, if you present the same one twice, card gets disabled. By the way, if you charge back on that, I'm not going to be happy. And I know who you are. Um, the check digits are different than the mag stripe. So, you know, if you present a, 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 a mag stripe CVV, then you're expected to know the name. Um, the contactless interface does not give you the name. I don't know if you noticed it just said like valued customer or some such. Um, you do not get the cardholder's name from the, uh, the RFID, from the contactless. So yeah, okay, there's, there's some protections on it. Another one that, that I actually discovered last night while I was testing, um, if you conduct multiple transactions worth $1 a piece from your own card going to your own Square account and into your own bank account, eventually your bank does get suspicious and start disabling things. <laughs> yeah, I've had some interesting conversations with my bank about this. No, really, it wasn't me. Anyway, the only other protection that we've seen is on uh, American Express. Um, American Express cards actually use a different card number entirely on the, uh, the contact list than they do on the, on the face of the card or the mag stripe. So yeah, there is some protection there. There's replay protection, there's out of order protection. Okay, fair enough. Um, the question is, does it work? Do the protections work? Well, here's the thing. Not really. I can read the card multiple times and conduct multiple transactions. As long as I present those CVVs in order, the card has no idea of time, so why wouldn't it work? Um, even more than that, consider the fraud vector. Um, let's say for the sake of argument that some evil person had put a high-powered RFID reader behind the door as you were walking in. And let's say for the sake of argument that high-powered RFID reader was reading every credit card that walked through that door, every single one of them. With traditional Magstripe style credit card fraud, you swipe the card once through my reader and I get all of your details and I can conduct as many transactions as I like. On the back end of that, the, the processor sees that all of these different people are reporting fraudulent charges and they all shopped at my store so they know that I'm, I'm malicious. And they can not only charge back those transactions, they can correlate it back to me as the fraudster and start disabling things. Well. We're making mag stripes. We can use those anywhere, anywhere except mag stripes. And okay, it doesn't have to be a you know bare white piece of plastic that looks kind of fishy. There's nothing to stop me reprogramming the mag stripe on this, and then it looks perfectly legit. So I can harvest lots and lots and lots of card numbers, write them back to lots and lots of cards, and use them in lots of different places. There's no single point of correlation anymore. 
And what's more, instead of it being one person that gets 50 transactions that you're probably going to notice, it's 50 people that get one transaction and half of them aren't going to notice. So it doesn't really work. It doesn't really offer you much in the way of protection. So it, it, it just forces the bad guys to change their tactics a little bit. And the important point is, for me to read your mag stripe, you have to give me your card. He never gave me his card. I never touched that thing. Never had physical contact with it. My, my equipment doesn't even necessarily have to have physical contact. I mean, depending on whether you count radio waves as or electromagnetic or magnetic field, whatever RFID is. If you count that as physical contact, eh, maybe. But that's a stretch at best. You want to see it work? Do we have a volunteer? <laughs> For real. So um, what, I'm, what I'm finding is that uh, different banks throw fraud alerts in different ways and after different numbers of transactions. Um, with, with my bank, Chase, um, it turns out if you conduct three identical transactions in quick succession for the same amount, the third one will fail because they, they'll see it as suspicious. So what I want to do is read someone's card five times. Now that the equipment is working, it will be just five times. Replay those in order and uh, see how close we can get to this $20 before your card gets disabled. <laughs> so is there anyone who wants to see their contactless card get disabled by their payment processor? <laughs> Not you. I, I can't do it with my card because I've already hit that point. Come on, do we have a volunteer? Someone? No one? Say that again? Uh, I'm not. So here's the thing. The first transaction will be 10 bucks, the second one will be 5 bucks, and then each successive one will be a dollar. So if they disable the second one, you get a real bargain on this $20 bill. <laughs> No one? Well, I guess you're not seeing this demo then. Maybe. Maybe. You want to go again? All righty then. Okay. <laughs> if you would be so kind as to swipe, let's let's go for five times. See how see how how we how we do. Okay. So we've got five reads. I don't print the card number there. Um, so behind the scenes, it's, it's writing this all out to a file in, in the same MagStripe format. Um, I, I could show you the raw data, but, but then I'd be putting card numbers on screen. I don't want to do that. So OK, let's go back to our MagStripe writer. And encode from the same file, which is the log. <laughs> this is not the card number you're looking for. OK, let's see how well we do here. OK, so transaction one, card written, $10, authorizing, approved. Nah, you don't need a receipt. <laughs> Done. Transaction two. Five dollars. Swipe the card. 
Authorizing approved. <laughs> Still don't need a receipt. You, you may not get too much of a bargain on this $20 bill. Okay, transaction three. Cards written, $2. Oh no, that's, well, no, that's 200. <laughs> I still don't need a receipt. <laughs> Swipe it. Authorizing. Oh, payment was not approved. Aww. Well, your $15 of $20 bill. Thank you very much. Um, if your bank is anything like mine, expect an email in about the next five minutes going, would you like this merchant to go to jail? <laughs> Effectively. Please click no. <laughs> okay, so you, you, you get the gist of it. If I read the card multiple times, I can write multiple mag stripes. As long as I write about in sequence, I can conduct multiple transactions. Um, arguably, I conducted three in a row there because, you know, it was the same guy. Um, I got three transactions, the fourth was rejected. With my own card, I got two transactions, the third was rejected. The, the back end processors set their own rules for this. But the point is, that's all going through the same point of sale terminal. If I'd taken this thing up to the hotel and, and you know, swipe that card in the lobby, by the way, your RFID interface is now off. You will not be able to use that as a contactless payment card now because it's, it's tripped that alert on the back end. If that hadn't happened, I'd be able to write a card and just you know, take it to 7-Eleven or you know, buy dinner with it or you know, keep using them in different places and that alert would never go off. So um, yeah, multiple reads means multiple transactions. So let's up the ante on this a little bit. Um, uh, high powered readers. This thing puts out a couple hundred milliwatts. We can do better. Um, three to five inches is actually pretty optimistic for this stuff. Um, we, if we took you know, the 200 milliwatt output from that, um, it, it operates at 13.56 megahertz. Well, 14 megahertz is, is a ham band which means that you can buy ham radio equipment that works at 14 megahertz, and it's close enough. It, it works. So you can get oodles of power really, really easily. I'm talking lots of power, like one and a half kilowatts is completely legal. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Um, so yeah, you can just keep amping up the power. And as you amp up the power and as you amp up the size of your antenna, your read range goes up and up and up. We believe, but we have not yet observed, that there is a theoretical limit somewhere around the 30 or 40 feet mark, we think. Um, we haven't actually gotten there yet. Um, I was hoping to have a high-powered reader to demo here, um, but we made the mistake of, of going from 5 watts to 20 watts and the magic smoke escaped. Um, we, we didn't get time to rebuild it in time for the conference. Um, I, I apologize. Uh, I, I'll probably have something along, it, along those lines ready for DEF CON. Um, most likely, but yeah, suffice it to say, it's, it's well within theory, it's well within predictions to say that tens of feet of read range are possible. But if you think about it, like I said, you know, when you're talking about choke points like doors, um, anything over, you know, two feet is, is totally workable. So yeah, you can, you can do that. So what about defending this stuff? Well, what about these, these Passive shields, these foil things. I'm sure you've, you've come across these things, right? I have a, a handful of them here. These, these little foil things, they, they work, right? They're, they're Faraday cages. Well, no, they're not. Anyone who calls this a Faraday cage is an idiot. <laughs> and you have my permission to slap them. The reason, the difference between this and a Faraday cage is that a Faraday cage is grounded. What that means is, as the energy is coming into this, this will develop a charge. Some of that charge will leak through into the card. If the thing is grounded, that charge dissipates to ground, there is no overall net charge on the device, so nothing gets through to the device inside it. 
So yeah, this is not a Faraday cage. This reduces the strength of the signal. It does not block it. Therefore, it does not block high-powered readers if you have a high enough powered reader. So we actually got hold of, of a bunch of these, um, you know, different foils, different uh, wallets. Um, you know, some of them are, are vendors that, that you've probably seen at places like ShmooCon. We got hold of these, we rented out a, an anechoic RF chamber, and uh, we, we tested them. Um, results are coming up in a sec, but the point is, the standard that all of these comply to, in fact, this very one, uh, okay, this one doesn't say it's, it's FIPS 201 approved. A lot of them say they're FIPS 201 approved. What FIPS 201 says is it's, it's all about the cards. And for the shields, they just say it, it stops it reading. So as long as there is a combination that that manufacturer can find of a card and a reader that doesn't work when their shield is around it, you're FIPS 201 approved. That's it. They specify nothing about power levels, nothing about attenuation, all of this stuff. So when we actually tested this, um, this is the attenuations that we saw. Um, so you're looking at a logarithmic scale. Um, each line is a factor of 10. So we're looking at decibels. We tested you know, a bunch of different products at the three major RFID bands, 125 kilohertz, 1356 megahertz, 900 megahertz. And you can see the lines are all over the place. Some, some quick conclusions that we can draw from this. No single product stood out as the best. Um, Diffaware, for example. Diffaware was by far the best at 125 kilohertz. It was the second best at 13.56 at, uh, megahertz, but at 900 megahertz, it was almost the worst. Th there is no good and bad product unless you know what technology you're trying to shield. Crumpling can raise or lower performance. You can see uh, some of these items are listed twice, once with a star after it. The ones with a star after them means it's a foil shield and we crumpled it to simulate wear and tear. Well, if you look at the first one, uh, the smooth trip, um, at 900 megahertz, crumpling the card made it perform less well. So the further down the line goes, the better the shielding is. At 900 megahertz, it made it perform more weakly. It didn't block as much of the signal. At 13.56 megahertz, the same two cards, the same two, uh, sorry, the same two shields, one crumpled, one not, the crumpled one performed better than the uncrumpled one. So you now need to factor in not only how much power are you putting into it, but how old is the shield? As well as, you know, what type of technology is it? What frequency are you using? Um, there's lots of variation on the market. So if you compare, let's say 13.56 megahertz, if you compare the worst one, which was the 3M card shield, um, that got a little over, that gave us a little over uh, 23, about 23 dB of loss. That's, that's reasonable. If you compare the best one, um, that gave us about 75 dB of loss. So there's a difference between the best and the worst of 50 decibels. Now for those of you who don't speak radio, that's a factor of 100,000 difference between these two products. One product was 100,000 times as effective as another one, both of which are FIPS 201 compliant. The, the essence of this, the, the point to take away of this, is that because there are no standards, there, there is no good product. We can't really say that any of these are good. We can't say that any of them are particularly bad. It's just a very complex problem to solve. And ultimately, you're, you're going to be defeated by the fact that the thing isn't grounded. So another quick demo here, just to kind of hammer home the, the, the idea that these things don't work. Um, I have here somewhere. Um, this is a, a, a low frequency RFID reader. This is 125 kilohertz. Um, this is unmodified. This is as it came from the manufacturer. And if I take my 125 kilohertz tag, light goes green and the code would come up if I was, yeah. So that's the code. So light goes green, card reads. If I put my tag in my FIPS 201 approved, electromagnetically opaque, government standard compliant shield, if I can get it in with one hand, that's what she said, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, shielded card. That's not right. 
It doesn't shield. They don't work. There was, out of all of the different products that we tested, there was only one that stopped a standard 125 kilohertz tag reading from a standard 125 kilohertz reader. And that was DiffAware because they design for 125 kilohertz. Everyone else does 13.56. So yeah, there's, th there are no good products out there. So yeah, that's 125 kilohertz. So instead, we invented this. This is what we call the guard bunny. Um, the idea of the guard bunny is that it acts kind of like an RFID tag. Um, it absorbs RFID energy in the same way. It operates at the same frequency. The difference is this has no CPU. It has no memory. It has no data storage. It has, it has nothing. It's all passive, discrete components, primarily. Um, because we have no CPU and memory, we're lower power than the tag. And, and what this does, if you look at how a tag works, you hit it with a certain amount of energy, it'll absorb what it needs, and it just kind of ignores the rest so that other tags can get hold of them. This, instead, it'll take as much energy as it can possibly get, and it does three things with it. First thing it does is it bounces it back to the reader as noise. So you can think of this as an RFID jammer. Um, second thing it does is lights up. And the third thing, I don't know if you can hear it, it makes a sound. So you know that your tags are being read, and just a, 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 quick, a quick demo of what I'm talking about here. Um, I have my, my test card. If I put my test card underneath the guard bunny and sit it on top of the reader, it fails. Thank you, prototypes. Doesn't read. If I now lift the guard bunny off, that's where it reads. So as long as this active device is somewhere within a few inches of your actual RFID tag, the signal from this is so overwhelming that it jams the signal from the legit tag, and the reader just can't tell the difference. Is it perfect? No, it's not. If I had to design a reader that would defeat Guard Bunny, is it possible? Yes, I could do it. Is it better than every passive shield on the market? We think so. Um, when can you have one? At the moment, you can't. These, the, these prototypes, um, they cost more to make than you would want to spend on them, I guarantee it. Um, we're trying to commercialize it at the moment. Um, we're, we're getting it all down to an ASIC. Um, the problem is that when you want to do a, f a run of chips on a fab, um, you're looking at at least six to nine months of lead time. And it's not one of these problems where if you double the money going in, you can halve the time. It just it doesn't work like that. So you know, if, if anyone does know of, of you know, fabs, we're finding fabs all over the place in all kinds of surprising companies. Um, if, if anyone does have a fab that they want to loan us to, to do a, a, a you know, prototype run or production run, please you know, get in touch. Um, we're happy to talk to folks about it. We, 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 we hope to have it on the market soon. So that's it. Any questions? Thank you. So I guess I've got five minutes just for a few questions. Yes, one at the front. So the question was, would it make sense to test the guard bunny the same way as we tested the shields? No, it wouldn't, because um, guard bunny isn't trying to block the signal. Um, it's trying to, to send more signal back. It's, it's the equivalent, it's the difference between putting your cell phone inside of an elevator car or turning on a cell phone jammer. It's, it's two totally different approaches that, that, that they can't be compared directly. Yes. Right, so the question is, if I create a whole stash of, of contactless reads, if the, person, if the victim uses their card once, does that stash get invalidated? Yes, it does. But again, it comes down to the breadth of the attack. If instead of reading 100 times for one person, I read it one time for 100 people. If 10% of those folks use their card, then you know, I've still got a bunch of good transactions. 
Yes. Double bagging your card. Um, we did actually test that. Um, it, it makes it better, but it's still not foolproof. You can still make a more powerful reader. Um, we, we actually tested you know, tin foil and some, some homemade shields, and they, they're all roughly the same. Yes. Could you use a capacitor on the shield to act as a ground? Not really. It has to be an actual ground connection because you have to have a circuit. Say what? Right, but you're talking about needing a DC ground for... Okay, right, 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 right. Yes, from row. Uh, the Guard Bunny at the moment, uh, this prototype is configured for 13.56 megahertz because it's designed to protect uh, RFID credit cards. We can rebuild it for any frequency that we like. The, the technology is, it's, uh, we've actually started patenting it because it's, it's so versatile and we can port it to any frequency. Yes? Have I thought about using a cell phone? Uh, I have. Um, Guard Bunny works very well to shield NFC because it's the same protocol. If you were to do it the other way around and try and use the NFC to shield your credit card, you could do it, um, but it would drain your battery very, very quickly. Yes. Uh, microwaving it. Yes, this is a good point. Um, if you want to be truly secure against a contactless credit card fraud, put your credit card in the microwave. Three seconds will kill the contactless chip. Five seconds will make the contactless chip catch fire. <laughs> not kidding. It will not mess up the mag stripe. Yes? Uh, no, because I'm not transmitting. It does not violate FCC jammer rules because it's not a transmitter. It's a passively powered device that works on M field uh, rather than EM radiation. They classify jammers as EM transmitters. I am not transmitting. I am in M field, so I'm not a jammer according to FCC definitions. Yes. Uh, it's a, a Vivo Pay 4500 uh, from a company called Vivo Tech. Say again. Passports. Um, so uh, the actual US passport, in, in fact, uses exactly the same chip at the same frequency that contactless credit cards do. So it's exactly the same issues, um, same read range gains, same benefit from Guard Bunny, same problems with shielding. Yes. What range did we see from the reader before we let the magic smoke out? Um, the range is actually a factor of the antenna and the, the output power, we got the output power up, we didn't get the chance to redesign the antenna. Um, we saw, I believe we got a foot out of it, um, and then you know we uprated the antenna, didn't have enough power to drive the antenna, so we uprated the power amp and blew smoke. Yes. So, so would you be able to use a, a bunch of old expired cards to act as a shield for a current card? No, it wouldn't. Um, they have a, a very effective anti-collision protocol. So they will only speak one after the other and they'll be queried in sequence. They will all be read. Um, with, with this, if you, not with this particular reader, but it's certainly possible to take a bag full of these tags and throw it through the RFID field of a reader and all of the bags in that tag will be read. After they expire, the chip continues working, but it continues working according to spec and according to protocol, which includes anti-collision. So you'll just get expired information out of it. Yes. Uh, yes, if you go to the Recursion website, um, there is some information about Guard Bunny there, um, or just ping me an email and I'll put you on the mailing list. Yes. Fraud prevention called him. <laughs> Round of applause for Visa, ladies and gentlemen. Yes.
Have I tried with CAC or HSPD 12? No, I haven't. Um, but it should work for anything that is governed by the ISO 14443 or ISO 15693 um, standards, which is a lot. So your MyFair, all the various variants of it, your uh, HID I-Class, um, basically anything that works at 13.56 will, will have the same effect. Okay, I should get out of here. Um, I'm going to be out there in just a few minutes when I've got all my gear packed up. I have to get out of here for the next speaker. So if you could just you know, find me outside in, in two minutes and I'll, I'll be happy to keep answering questions.